Welcome everyone to another episode of our exciting podcast series of talking to owners about their journey, how they started and where they're going. And today we have a special guest, Anthony Halsh. He is the CEO and founder of Rocks Box Containers. And his story is exciting. If you want to get back to that fire of that startup feeling of when you had a big idea and maybe it was a while back for you, listen to this episode, watch it on YouTube and be inspired by how Anthony Halsh has launched something important in the world, clever, and I think with limitless potential. So we're really excited to talk to Anthony and let's let him in right now. Well, welcome Anthony to the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Hi, Jose. Thanks for being here. Yeah, so it's a, it's it's something I was very much looking forward to. But again, we'd like to provide a little bit of context for our audience. If you just tell us, you know, your company name and who you serve and what do you do for them? Certainly. So I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Rocksbox Containers. We are a modular manufacturer in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we build all sorts of different buildings out of shipping containers and steel framed modular structures. Uh, we service industries, a lot of in the food and beverage industry. Uh, we do bars, restaurants, commercial kitchens, um, and bathroom modules, uh, stages, you know, a lot of stuff for entertainment. Uh, we also do experiential marketing containers for high-end brands. Um, so we've done stuff for Adidas Golf, Nokia and Tires, and there's going to be a bunch more coming out this year that'll be very exciting for us. Um, and so those go to trade shows. They travel around the country a lot of times. They're on trailers. Um, and these ones are like transformers. They've got rooftop decks. They've got pulled outside, wow. you know, lighting and signage and, and all sorts of different stuff that comes up. So it's, it's definitely making, makes an impact when they, when they show up with that one. Um, and then we do stuff for the commercial industry. You know, we've done um, mo modular retail units uh, that uh, go in for, you know, six months at a time or, or three months at a time for certain activations. Um, and so those can be, you know, small little retail huts for different people for, you know, small startup companies. Um, we've done confined space training simulators. So this is a, a, a 20 foot, 40 foot container that has tubes or uh, things within it that uh, we, we give to, uh, you know, different municipalities that where they're going down into tunnels or, or mining companies, you know, anything that's like underground or could be considered a confined space that they would train with those. Um, and then we've also done uh, healthcare units. Uh, we're currently working for the Boy Scouts of America on a, on a new project that's um, for uh, healthcare units for them. So we, we really, we have a lot of different things that we get into and, you know, our client base can honestly be anyone who uh, has a need for a, either a portable or a permanent structure that's either in, you know, a remote location or difficult to build on. And we can build everything in the factory to a turnkey standpoint have it stamped and approved by the local um, building departments or authority having jurisdiction, and then uh, you know install these buildings into these locations that otherwise may be more difficult to do. So it's a wide ranging of industries, but um, you know mostly if it fits in a box or in a in a rectangle shape, we can we can pretty much build it out. Well, that's that's fascinating. So how I mean I'm just curious, how did you come about? I mean people don't just walk down the street and say one day, or maybe they do, say. <laughs> Gee, I wonder if there's a different, completely different use for like standard containers. I mean, what was the inspiration for this? Sure. Well, to be honest, it started from a quite, quite humble thought. Uh, I was uh, attending the Colorado School of Mines for Engineering in Golden, Colorado. Um, I uh, got a football scholarship to play out here. I grew up in Iowa on a farm. And so, you know, uh, the uh, construction industry and, and that, uh, that industry, the engineering uh, field is always been a, a passion of mine. I've got my education in it. And uh, to be honest, I was just looking for extra money in college uh, when I, I had some buddies that were in the shipping industry and uh, were telling me about these, you know, half retired gentlemen that were driving shipping containers around making a hundred dollars an hour round trip. And I figured, well, I mean, that's great. I could do that, you know, part-time and when I'm in college and, you know, make some extra money, that's pretty good money to make. So um, I grew up on a farm. So driving a big truck and trailer wasn't a, wasn't a problem. And I uh, started looking into it more. And what I found was, you know, the industry of, in and of itself, the, the shipping industry of, of dealing with intermodal shipping containers is that it's, it's fairly archaic. It's been the same way since we invented the shipping container, you know, in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, and um, hasn't really changed much. And so, you know, a lot of the, the companies that, that were doing it at the time in 2015 were still using paper logs and, and things like that. 
And so I actually had one of the first, if not the first, um, website that uh, sold e containers on an e-commerce platform. Um, wow. So essentially, and not, not many, I mean, we, we didn't hardly sell any on the e-commerce platform, but having it and, and showing that people, it was available to purchase. You were, still the fir you were the first. <laughs> right. They still called us and they st we still got those sales, right? So it, it started very humbly. I, I bought two shipping containers, put them on Craigslist, and we started to build our company from that end. And at, at this point, I was still in college. So um, once uh, once that happened, I one of my fantastic professors at School of Mines is John Sturmel. And um, he helped me get the first company started. And uh, like I said, I bought two containers, put them on Craigslist. Well, that was going into the summer of 2015. And we had just crushed it. We were selling tons of containers. Uh, the business did about $500,000 in the first like six, seven months. Wow. And it was time to go back to school in August. And uh, I called up my professor and I was like, listen, I, I, I need to go back to school. I want to finish my degree. But I've got this company and it's running and it's making money. And I don't know, I can't, I can't do both. And yet, you know, he was like, well, you know, if it's something you're passionate about and uh, you, you want to pursue it, he's like, listen, you know, go do it. You can always come back to school. And um, so I did it and I jumped and made the leap and um, started selling shipping containers to, to anybody, all, uh, you know, farmers, ranchers, um, businesses that needed extra storage in the dry. I could have 320 square feet of in the dry storage delivered right to their building or their residence. And now were these, were these, so you weren't manufacturing the shipping container. Not at all. You were finding older shipping containers that may have been like out of service for yep. main, like they weren't going on the water anymore, but, but they still had value. It's still a court, exactly. you know, whatever it is, galvanized steel, whatever, whatever shipping containers made. And you'd have them shipped to a farmer who needed storage. Like you said, how many square feet? Uh, or how many cubic feet of storage? Three, 320 square feet of storage, yep. Right, so that's like instantly in a sealed box that's, I guess, you know, a lot less expensive than building a structure of that size. Totally, totally. And, and so that became your business. That started picking up pace and, and, and so on. And, and, and we, we're, to your knowledge, were you one of the few people doing this in the space at all? Well, I was one of the few new ones doing it, right? And, right. and that's where I think the big thing, I made some enemies to, to start the business that, okay. you know, these gentlemen were, uh, you know, mostly, they, they've been in the business for 10 years, you know, and they it had a good, you know, consistent sure. revenue stream and all this <laughs> stuff. And then I started coming in and I, I wasn't planning to, you know, have a small revenue stream. I wanted to grow a big company. And so I took a substantial amount of the business out of Denver and, and, uh, yeah, I made it shook some things up for sure. That's that's for sure. <laughs> wow. But now now so so here you are, right? Just like literally not even fully out of college yet at this point with a great big idea. It's booming. That's exciting. Now, did you at that point have to hire anybody? Were you bringing people on board? Did you have buddies that you brought along with you? I mean, it yeah. seems like a lot of work to do. Even a young person working really hard, you run out of hours. 100%. I mean, yeah, at this time, you know, it, it didn't matter what how many hours it was i was you know up at five and, and work until one or two in the morning you know just what didn't matter it was the most fun thing i've ever done in my life was building the beginning of this you know and it hasn't changed but uh but um you know that's those first you know for first few months you know you don't know what you're doing you want to make sure you're mm -hmm. doing the best thing ever you know and all this and and yeah i brought along uh one of my buddies from school of mines um uh, we played football together and um he was he was interested in joining the team hell of a sales guy um, and so, yeah, we, we did that together and then, uh, brought on another, another person that was also a buddy and, um, yeah, those two stayed with me for quite a while. And, um, we built this up to, um, in 2017, we built that up to about $1.8 million in revenue in, um, wow. in two years, you know, from starting from Good scratch. For you, man. That's awesome. That's a really exciting story. Hey, pardon the interruption. It'll just be a beat. We want to tell you about something that's really exciting and it might be very exciting to you if you're the owner ceo leader of a b2b company roughly with two to 20 million dollars in revenue and you feel a little bit stuck you know what i mean sales are a little flat maybe even declining challenge margins are being squeezed sales cycles seem to be lengthening and lead flow is uncertain we've designed the program based on over a dozen years of us doing exactly this for many B2B companies, it's called the Competitive Edge Program. And you can learn more about it at valueprop.com forward slash edge. Tells you all about the program. It's a 90 day program, really focused on helping you sharpen your value proposition, aligning your value delivery, 
making sure your marketing program is doing what it has to do if you're in B2B, which is generate opportunities and make sure your sales process is tight so that you can convert those opportunities into sales. So with that note, let's get back to an exciting episode of the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Yeah, you, you, I mean, it's the classic. You saw a need, you started small, you proved out your concept, right? With mm-hmm. two containers, you didn't go out and buy like, you know, borrow and, and buy 17 right. containers. You proved your idea and it and it took off. But now you, you made a transition around that time into something mm-hmm. else. Like when we started talking about where you are today, and that's just a couple of years ago, like pre, yeah. maybe two years pre-COVID. So, and we'll get into the COVID impact in a moment if there is any, but so what caused you to make a transition or to do something different? Sure. So we, we had actually, I mean, that year we were, we were, we were kicking butt, right? Mm-hmm. We were, we were doing very well. Um, and, and what we had, what we were preparing for, for 2017 was in 2015 and 2016, when we went through those winter times in Denver, um, you know, half of our market essentially gets shut off in the winter time because, um, sure, we can deliver down um, in in the uh, in the front range area and in the eastern plains, but you, you really can't get a container up into a driveway, you know, in Summit County, Colorado, near Breckenridge, uh, in the middle in the middle of the winter time, right? You're you're looking, you're talking about six to ten feet of snow sometimes in the right. side roads. So that you know, essentially cut off half our market. Well, we wanted to take out that valley that we were experiencing mm-hmm. in the you know the seasonality of the business, and so. We did take on some money and went to um, uh, bought some trucks and trailers and moved down to Texas and to Houston and was running between Houston and San Antonio every day. And then I'd sell out of San Antonio to the western half of Texas. And there was only one other person doing that at the time. And so we had a really, really good system. We would bring two to three containers to San Antonio every day and have one driver deliver out of San Antonio to deliver those two or three boxes, right? Okay. So um, we were kind of doing a chain reaction um, and we actually had a backhaul from Houston. So we would pick up a box in San Antonio, bring it back to the ports in Houston. So we were getting paid essentially both ways um, to, to do the transport. And so we got really lucky with that backhaul. Well, unfortunately, uh, and that's how we got to 2.8 or 1.8 million that year was we had another market that we were selling into for the whole summertime. So okay. we were, we were cranking away and that's when I had a little extra money in the pocket and I wanted to do the thing that I'd been planning on doing was build some stuff out of these containers. So, okay. um, I took on a small investor. Um, he gave us like 15, 20 grand of, of some extra capital, um, to build this out and cause he was interested in being a part of the construction business that was doing this container. So he was our first investor and, um, really helped us out immensely during those times. And, um, built out our first beer can is, is our, is that's our main best selling product today. Um, and that was our first ever product built was the beer can. It's a 20 foot container with three windows, uh, around the front side of it. And then it's got an eight foot walk-in cooler in the back. And so essentially you have uh, a walk-in cooler where all the kegs are stored. And then there's a wall with a direct draw tap system on it and then three windows to serve out. of. So you so, built out, you hold on, you built in the refrigeration, you built in all of that into that ready to roll. You could drop it anywhere. It's an instant beer center, so to speak. Exactly. Exactly. That's then, amazing. That's, that's fantastic. It, it, it was, it's the most impressive thing about it is to be honest, it's functionality. So, you know, we took that to one of our, well, the, the gentleman who helped me design the box was a brewery owner. And so he had a need for a high output um, bar, essentially. And what we gave him was a high output bar where you had three serving windows. So you could have six lines, two lines at each window coming up to grab a beer and four or five bartenders on the inside running back and forth to the tap wall to get beer. And so <clears throat> the first weekend that we had it out for the 4th of July, um, we sold the brewery out of beer. So oh they, they ran out of kegs of beer because they were able to sell so much so fast. And that was kind of our big, like, oh, aha moment, right? There's and something going on over here, this, right? Yeah, that's this a good is, idea. Yeah, right. Wow. So that's when we really jumped into construction. And then, unfortunately, um, at the end of 2017, uh, Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. And Thanks. so all the money and all the good things that we had invested into that program, um, I mean, they it dried up very quickly. And, you know, the bills didn't stop and that kind of stuff. And so what I did was we, we wrapped everything up, sold what we could, um, wrapped everything up in the first business. And then um, essentially we, we just took the container idea, right? And I started Roxbox Containers. That, that's the current entity that we're in right now. And I started that in January of 2018. So um, this is, like I said, our fourth year in business now. 
But um, by doing that, you know, we, we knew we had something with the construction side of it, right? And we, we knew we had a good experience in the shipping containers. And so um, by, by going more into the construction route, you know, we were able to fund ourselves with our current knowledge of, you know, brokering shipping containers. And at this point, we had no trucks or trailers. We were completely out of the transportation industry. We were brokering all this stuff. And essentially, we'd get a client, buy a box, and then we'd have them find a driver, essentially, to, to get it delivered okay. to their house. So, um, you know, we got out of that whole game um, and, and really started focusing on the construction aspect of this and the design build aspect of this business. And that's, you know, that's really where we're at now. We, we don't even sell shipping containers anymore. Uh, we don't own any trucks, no trailers, none of that stuff. And it's all, it's all in the factory. Well, what you did is you, you moved from, uh, you know, kind of trading time for, 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 for dollars, which is great. I mean, if you do it at scale, you know, there's a lot of companies. I know some sure. reach billions of dollars just doing trading time for dollars. But you, you shifted yourself into really the, the world of intellectual property. You came up with ideas, designs, and that's what you get paid for. And at, it done right, and, um, and I'd like to hear the rest, you know, we're going to continue this conversation, but done right, that could be a lot more profitable than any time for dollar uh, arrangement. So yeah. that, that's very exciting how you made that shift. And the beer thing kind of proved, hey, there's something with working with old containers. So here's a question for you. So containers, right? So Rocksbox, you work with containers as a beginning point in all of your designs basically is that is that the like the the the, the big yeah, idea there essentially yeah i mean we do uh, we we're just dabbling now um into the the full-blown modular steel frame modular so mm -hmm. essentially what that means is we, we build a floor skid and a ceiling skid right so you've got two of the, almost the exact same design uh right skid, and then um you put uh, structural steel supports um, in the sides and in the ends, and then frame out the frame out the box with normal um, framing, steel framing um, that would be in any commercial building. And then now you have a shell. And, and what's, what's unique about those is a shipping container. You're constrained to an eight foot width. Um, and so when we're doing like certain commercial kitchens or higher end restaurants and things like that, there's certain municipalities that we'll be delivering into that require us to have a three foot walkway um, inside of a kitchen. And with current kitchen equipment and the way these have to be laid out, there's not, it's not possible to get a three foot walkway in a shipping container. And so because food and beverage is our biggest, um, uh, you know, biggest industry that we sell to, uh, we have to solve that problem. And the, that problem is being solved now by us developing these modulars and there's, there's steel frame modular structures um, that are 10 feet wide. And essentially we can build them, you know, 10 by 10, 10 by 20. Um, and we think we're probably going to stop at the 10 by 20, because if we need a 10 by 40, we just add another 20 right. on the other end. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a different thought process and it, it does get away from the shipping container a little bit. Um, but it also offers us, you know, more clientele that um, need a, an advanced option beyond a container. Yeah, but the principle still that you at your centralized uh, fabrication facilities, that you can design a modular very complex thing, whole kitchen, of, you know, pub distributions, whatever that thing is. And when you deliver it, the recipient now gets a complete solution, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's, that's the thought. They don't have to worry about anything at that point. They're not doing uh, like brand new construction. It's like it arrived. The yep. kitchen arrived. Yeah. I love that idea. That's a fantastic yeah. idea. I, I, of course, it's, it seems obvious to me now as, as I hear it, it's like, well, that would, of course, be successful. Um, yeah. Now I saw on your website things like even like for exhibits, trade shows, things like that. Is that a, is that another interesting market for you? Totally, yeah. And that's I mean you know that's probably one of the most fun I would say. Um, the, the beer can, you know, the the bar box and stuff like that. You know, we're dealing with um, left hand brewing, Odell's brewing, um, you know, Ten Barrel, like a lot of high end brands that do mm -hmm. you know craft brewing and stuff. Um, and so that that is certainly a fun uh, area as well that we get to go to those parties and things. And then. With the experiential marketing, you know, we're dealing with Fortune 500 brands that are, um, you know, we're, we're developing some crazy stuff with AR and VR and, you know, different stuff right now that's going to get pretty crazy this year. Um, and we're, we're excited to um, show off what, what's going to come out of the, the factory this year for sure. Wow. So when you, when you talk to somebody who might be able to use your product, uh, are you educating them to get them interested or are they approaching you because they've seen it somewhere else and they say, hey, can you do this? 
No, there's definitely both. Um, you know, the, the one thing now that there's more of, well, I want the Adidas container. I want the left hand container, right? You know, they're just, they're like, oh, well, they did it. So if they did it, they designed it, I'm going to use their yeah. design, right? And so, you know, we can, we can, you know, print those yeah. off basically um, a lot of times and, and redo those units. And so we get those where, and, and we can go into productization. I want to get back to that here a little bit. But um, the other side, though, is education. So Unfortunately, one of the things about the container industry is that there's been a lot of, um, you know, Discovery, HGTV, um, you know, those types of shows done with shipping containers. And there's a very common misconception that if you build with a shipping container, it's going to be cheaper than building with stick built construction. Well, that's, that's, it's not 100% true. Um, and there's certain levers that are drivers of that. So, um, the, the drivers I said, I guess, would be that um, it's steel frame construction. So you're, you're getting a building that's significantly stronger than any wood building that, that's out there. Um, but then the other thing is the speed component. So the overall cost of the square footage might be more, but if we're able to deliver it, you know, six, eight months faster than right. an on site project, if it's a business, you're looking at six to eight months of revenue that you could right. potentially, you know, the opportunity cost of going stick build is, is massive, way more than the, you know, maybe 15% that you're going to spend with us um, getting it done this quickly. So, you know, there, there is savings for sure, but not necessarily dollars and cents. It's more in the opportunity cost situation of timing. Well, that's, but again, for a business audience, that is the issue, right? They're looking at the total sure. life of a project. Most projects get funded with a 24, 36 month, like visibility to what the whole project is. So you just, what you, you're, you're front loading a little bit of cost, maybe over and above traditional methods, mm -hmm. but you're accelerating time to time to revenue, which is like Certainly. huge. Plus I think the, the, the whole container look and feel is an aesthetic mm -hmm. of its own. So not, not every designer wants that aesthetic, but for those who can play with that, it can create a differentiated look. Totally. Uh, to whatever you do than, than anything else that's out there. So I, I just see a lot of huge opportunities there. And it doesn't surprise me that you guys are booming right now. So this is great. Yeah, so, no, it's definitely, it's funny you say the, the container aesthetic because that I think is really one of the things that is such a, it's such a visceral reaction. When people, you know, they, they walk into our office and we've got beautiful offices here in Denver. Anyone's welcome to come join whenever you want. Just give us a call and we'll, uh, we'll show you around. But uh we have great offices down here and when they walk in, you know, you can hear the grinders in the back and buzzing and all that stuff. And, you know, it doesn't look like that big of a building. And then you walk back to the back of the factory is boom, you know, opens everything up and you see, you know, 12, 15 containers sitting in there, sparks flying all over. And, you know, our clients are just like, whoa, you know, it's like this it whole is, production. A, yeah, absolutely. There's something about it that, that, Again, you can really, I can even visualize feeling, looking at your website, I saw some, a lot of just cool designs. So you start thinking, this is like Legos, but like giants uh, yes. size, <laughs> that you can do things with. So that's really, yeah. really Legos. That's what we call them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so here's a question, right? So uh, the last two years, no surprise to anybody listening to this, uh, to this uh, interview or watching it on, vi on YouTube, uh, lot's been happening in the world. Uh, and in fact, shipping containers are a big part of the story, right? They're not making them to destinations and so on. Right. So question, how has the events of the last couple of years with the pandemic, how has it affected you either way? Or sure. have you been able to ride above it? Well, uh, to be honest, COVID helped our business significantly. Um, with what we do with food and beverage, we create, we've been in this, in this business for a while of ghost kitchens, right? So okay. last mile delivery, um, you know, uh, delivery drivers not going to, you know, a front facing kitchen. It's a, it's a not, it, there's no advertising. It's a kitchen sitting somewhere that delivery drivers have only have that address and that's where they go to pick up your food. So this is becoming really big. And because our products don't have a dining room, this changed a lot of people's thoughts on what they could do from a restaurant perspective and restaurant tour. Gotcha. So we were getting honestly inundated with leads on all sorts of our kitchens and our ghost kitchens because they don't have a dining hall. And when all these restaurants and stuff were, were shut down because they couldn't have a, you know, a room with a dining hall in it. And it was, it, there were some times where there was no delivery at all. Um, and then there was other times where it was just delivery and, you know, things like that. And so 
um, by them having to pay for a whole kitchen plus a dining hall um, when all they were able to serve was all delivery customers. You know, these restaurants were, were you know, between a rock and a hard place. Absolutely. And so a lot of them were able to get out of their leases or whatever and then use whatever money they had left or some of the some of them got EIDL or PPP money. And they were able to use that to then, you know, buy some of our products and um, then put them wherever they had a location, right? Lease a lot or whatever, and you're able to still operate your business, but you're not paying for that, um, that large lease cost. So that really spiked a lot of stuff for us. We also had a, a fully contained uh, two bedroom ICU um, hospital unit that um, was uh, like a full blown ICU negative pressure. It had all the componentry in it, um, you know, MERV 18, I think filters, like just, you know, it was a full blown ICU. And wow. um, we got a lot of attention with that. Unfortunately, none of our governments bought any of those um, to prevent the next pandemic from happening and overloading our hospitals. Um, so that's, I think that's a big failure of our government that we didn't do anything to prevent the next one um, by using different methodologies of building. Um, you know, our hospitals currently run all the time before the pandemic at, you know, 85 to 95% capacity sure. because they don't want beds empty. And right. then, you know, we have a situation like this where, you know, they need a lot of beds and they're not available. You run into these big issues. People are dying at home and, you know, it's just a, it's a problem. Well, our solution is a 40, 40 foot shipping container that you can mothball those things and they sit in a yard for 10, 15, 20 years. And then if you need it, you, un, you know, you, you take off the shrink wrap and deploy it to wherever you need to into any hospital area. Um, and so that got us a lot of attention, which was great. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to help in that regard um, with the pandemic. We were able to um, help a lot of our restaurants and bars, though, by creating what we call the patio box. And so essentially, it's two 40-foot shipping containers married together um, that have both the ends open. And so it's covered, it's a covered patio space. So with that, um, they're still sitting all over the downtown area um, for people to go utilize. People are still using them all the time. And so um, that helped. And we, we did those at, you know, cost basically, um, covered our overhead to get those done and we did them really quickly for our community. So that was a huge thing for us as well, that we wanted to do something to, to give back because, you know, we were doing all right and a lot of other businesses were not. And so that's one thing that, you know, we, we did a lot of those and we got a ton of attention on that as well. And so, um, you know, with that, we, that last year during 2020, we won uh, runner up manufacturer of the year. You know, uh, we won Inno on fire last year, you know, a bunch of different awards. Uh, we were a Colorado company to watch last year. And a lot of that stuff came from the things we were doing during the pandemic to, to help out and assist. So I would say it was definitely very positive for us um, as unfortunate as, as that is to say, but, um, you know, it did help our business grow. Well, look, I, I, the way I, I hear that, that story here, uh, Anthony, is that you, you, you did well by doing good because you, you responded to where, where there was some real gaps and needs. I mean, there was, I, mean uh, I know restaurants in, in my area that have just gone out of business. And, you know, that's with owners like sacrificing everything, putting their house on the line and trying to pay their employees. And it just, they just ran out of time because- yep. You know, you can't, you know, your, your whole thing, you know, typical kitchen to square footage is like 80, 20, right? So your uh, kitchen to the total square footage is only like 20%, 80% is all that space for people to sit. If they can't sit there, you're still paying rent on that. Um, that's brutal. It's a brutal, you know, and it was no fault of their own, you know, right. stuff had to happen. So I, I see, I think you've responded in some really, I think, intelligent ways, useful ways. I think that, that I see you in a box. Uh, I think probably the world hasn't seen the last of that. I, I see no. utility in that. That there might, it, you know, candidly, it might be an NGO for more international yeah. uh, applications that might be interested in that. You know, somebody somewhere is gonna. It has to be somebody with deep, deep pockets. Yeah. You know, but somebody somewhere is gonna say that's like such a good idea. We can't ignore it. And right. and I think there'll be application there. But I, I just kudos to you to thinking creatively and and. And I get the sense in talking to you from your energy here that you're not even done yet with good ideas. I mean, there's a, oh, there's yeah. a right. There's, I'm sure you guys have like a whiteboard full of like, and then we'll do this, you know? So, which is great. I, I love it. I, I think there's an endless utility to what you're describing because it's it, the idea of being able to, in one location, prefab something that's ready to drop 
And the physical form factor of a container means we have an infrastructure that knows how to deliver things that size. Totally. Right. Totally. So, it's huge. That, you know, it, it, so that makes it really flexible, very useful. And uh, you'll gain capabilities there, notoriety, you know, kudos to you. Wonderful story. And, and, and how you did that, you know, just, I mean, again, just going to school, having also, you mentioned a professor that, that served as a mentor. Yes. Yes. And, that was and that's such a, such a powerful thing. You know, he's paying it forward through you. So that's, that's a really great story. So, so Anthony, if somebody wanted to know more about your story and where to find your products, just to learn more about you, where should they go uh, on the web and how should they get a, a hold of you? Sure. Yeah. So uh, rocksboxcontainers.com. It's R-O-X-B-O-X. Containers is plural.com. You can find us there. Um, there's tons of information on there and lots of great pictures. And then our Instagram is uh, just Rocksbox Containers. So um, just take off the, uh, you know, the www and the .com and that's what you got for Instagram. Um, and so there's awesome pictures on there and a bunch of stuff. And if you ever want to call us and chat with one of our sales development people, um, you know, our number is 303-997-8875. And like I said, if anytime anyone wants to come visit the shop, we love showing it off. Um, it's a great building and uh, we're doing some really cool stuff in here. Wow. If ever I'm in Denver, when it's not yes, snowing, sir. I right, want to take right. you up on that offer. <laughs> Anthony Halsh, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Really appreciate it. I think it's just a, a very exciting story. I'm glad we get to share it. Awesome. No, it was great to be here, Jose. I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, thanks for listening to another episode of the Revenue Throughput Podcast. If you like this episode, and if you like the series, make sure you subscribe below. And also, if you liked it, please do review it. When people are looking for something exciting to listen to, especially the kind of content we're bringing, which is practical insights for B2B companies, this is a place and a free resource that they can take advantage of. Let them know about it with your review. So subscribe, review, enjoy. Thanks again.